Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 24th day of November, Black Friday, in the year of our Lord, 2023. Yeah, that's someplace I never... Yeah, the, the day the dollar dies. Oh, that reminds me of that, that song, that, that rather funky, mystical sound. What was it? Bye-bye, uh, uh, Miss American Pie. Drove my Chevy to the levee, and the levee was dry. And good old boys were drinking whiskey and wine, rye, singing, This will be the day that I die. That was that's a was a very strange song. Um had all kinds of strange elements in it. Don't take your inspiration from music. Uh, even, you know, as I think I was mentioning the other day, Keith Green, maybe I didn't post that video, um, someone hooked me up with his music, and I was a, a young Christian, and they were young Christians, and, uh, but Keith Green was a young man, a Jewish man, actually, uh, he became a Christian, but he, uh, I was part of the Jesus Revolution, uh, was a musician. His music was very popular. He actually gave his records away you know, uh, at his concerts and, and things. Uh, uh, ended up having his own record company because he could not abide with the commercialism of the, you know, the, the music industry, the so-called Christian music industry. Those were the days. I remember those times. Uh, Jesus festivals, and a lot of it was not, you know, they were they called the Jesus freaks. But I mean, the only reason it's called that is because of Chuck Smith and the West Coast. But the Holy Spirit was actually working all over this world, uh, calling young people to them, to themselves. One of the uh, the important voices in that time was Francis Schaeffer, a Christian philosopher, sort of that had a, a retreat in La Brea in Switzerland. And uh, he was one of the thinkers of that day, uh, definitely uh, one of the forefront in uh, uh, opposing abortion and the corruption of culture among evangelicals. Um, a reformed background, but... He did not hold. I remember some of the things. His, his, uh, he was not a hardline Calvinist. He did not hold to the eternal decree of all things, from what I can remember. Uh, he has like a five-volume set um, of his writings. It's uh, interesting. If you're going to read a Christian philosopher, I would say read him. Although uh, he has some certain ideas about involvement in the world that I do not agree with because they're not biblical. But nevertheless, as, as a Christian thinker, he's certainly better than, say, William Lane Craig or something like that. Uh, he, he died quite a while ago now. But he, he was a contemporary. Of course, he was an old man, and I was a young man. But, uh, yeah, so I grew up with the charismatic movement. Not in it. I mean, I grew up not not as a youth, I was a Lutheran. This stuff was far, far, far away. Not even something mentioned. It did show up in Lutheranism. I do know that we moved uh, when I was, well, this was when I was like a senior in high school, uh, to, a, to a different house out in a different location, sort of out in the country. And there was a, the only Lutheran church around there was... Uh, one there, I didn't really go there very often at all. <laughs> I didn't, I, I wasn't into that at that time anyway. Uh, I was in, deeply into myself. <laughs> but uh, uh, I remember my mother complaining because there were, uh, there was apparently a traditional Lutheran worship in a small Lutheran church. And Apparently, there are some of the ladies in the church had become charismatic. Uh, and I remember my mother <clears throat> saying that, that, you know, they weren't agreeing with what was being done there in the church, probably because they were saying it was like death. 
But, uh, but she, I remember she said, well, they've got something that, that we don't seem to have. Well, yeah. Uh, and uh, again, at the, at the beginning of the charismatic movement, it was pretty tame. Uh, it, uh, and in some ways, it was, it did bring life into dead denominations. What happened, I think I've, I don't know if I've posted that video or not. <laughs> about, I think about half of the videos I make actually make it on uh, YouTube. I just don't post them. Um, they just don't end up going the way I think they should go. But the charismatic movement happened when the speaking in tongues jumped out of the traditional wrong side of the tracks, Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism was nothing. It was fringe out there. Yeah, you had people like Rex Humbard and and uh, some of these other characters that were beginning to come on television, but it was still really not, uh, it was not acceptable Christianity in the United States. It was certainly not mainstream at all. Of course, in my family, Baptists were considered very weird. My mother did not approve of Baptist worship. She was invited with a friend of hers to go to a Baptist church when she was young and uh, visit, and she visited there and was uh, appalled by the, the, uh, the frivolity before worship. Yeah, I, I think as a, as a uh, person that grew up in Lutheranism, I would say, yeah, that's one of the elements I miss, although biblically— I can't say it's required. I mean, I, I look at it and say, I, I it was more serious. You sat quietly. You were supposed to be preparing yourself for worship. Well, the Catholic Church is like this, too. You didn't have people wandering all over the place, talking with their friends and everything else. Uh, and sometimes in Baptist churches, they actually do that as part of the worship service, believe it or not. Spend 10 or 15 minutes in so-called fellowship, which is utterly... They don't know what fellowship is. Fellowship is koinonia. Well, who is our, it's not what is our fellowship. Who is our fellowship? Jesus Christ. Going around talking to your friends has nothing to do with fellowship, Christian fellowship, because Christian fellowship is based on that you are in Christ and the other people are in Christ too, and he is our fellowship. So it's not about him. It's not Christian fellowship. You can have all the fellowship dinners you want. You can all have all the fellowship time. But it's if it's not fellowship with Christ, it's nothing at all. It's just wasted time. Uh, so, but that was, uh, yeah, I, that, that, that's, I can understand that. I, I, and I think that's one of the reasons why some evangelicals end up going to Catholicism or something, which is a really jump into the, the abyss because it's got history, it's not just something that was created in the last few years. And uh, it, it, the formalism, it, it is it directs your thoughts toward God, but it's powered by the flesh. It is it is things that appeal to your flesh, like the architecture and images and and the atmosphere. There is just to, designed to feel spirit, spiritual. Uh, the Puritans rejected that. And they went with simplicity. Uh, but they overdid everything, too. But, yeah, I, I do miss that, and I miss the, the music. Although some Lutherans have gone contemporary, too. It's like, you know, either either you got this... Uh, where where is there something where we combine all the good things together? I don't know, but it, it's yeah. I I would say Lutheran worship is much more serious. I'm not talking about the current ELCA that that is satanic in more ways than one. But no, the the uh, as long uh, the and there are for, there are contemporary Lutheran churches. And there's people that actually draw, dress in a regular suit rather than religious garb, the garb of the Catholic priesthood. It's like, really? Come on. Luther talked about the priesthood of all believers. See, he was 
double-minded. <laughs> he was trying to hold on to Roman Catholicism. I, I mean, I can understand why Luther might have done some of these things. But the downstream consequences have been bad. Uh, he was trying to hold on to Roman Catholicism. He just wanted to reform the church. So he wasn't trying to get rid of the images and everything else. He had some followers that were. Uh, but he didn't think that was important. He thought that the, the issue was the gospel. And he was right about that. But the other stuff forms part of the anti-gospel environment. But considering what he was trying to do, you kind of do it one step at a time. Uh, an instant revival, those don't happen. You have to, in order to bring, he was trying to bring the church back to something more biblical, but you can't just do it all at once. But the problem is, how do you not do it all at once? You need like a revolution in some ways, but then you create all kinds of other problems. God has to do it. Uh, the best way to do it is just start something new. That's my been my experience. Trying to save an old church is no. Uh, if 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 it's not a if it doesn't have a regenerate congregation, mm -mm. no, no, you can't. Um, you can't do it because there's nothing to build on there. It is so many that I think a lot of the country churches are like that. They've been around long enough that. The, the original members might have been, you know, born again, but they, they tend to go away from that. Oh, I didn't, I forget, failed to look up what I was going to look up, didn't I? Uh, no, maybe not. Let me see here. Not adequately prepared this morning. Yeah. So what I want to talk about, first of all, is I did a, a video the other day on um, Mike Bickle. And the Mike Bickle affair. <laughs> a lot more people are coming out now uh, on the internet saying, well, yeah, I had contacts with him and this is what happened to us. And it wasn't all sexual, but just uh, the uh, domineering dictator style leadership, which all, it seems to always happen in those kind of churches. Uh, the, the bigger the church, the more of a problem. And also, the if a church is started by a particular individual, just don't go there. I mean, it, if it's all around them, it becomes a personality cult. I mean, a person can start a church and structure it in such a way it, that it becomes like a congregational church, which is the only uh, the only proper form of church government. <laughs> a regenerate church, congregational government. And then you don't have these problems. Even uh, elders, plural elders, they can become the inner core, and that's bad, too. Now, if you have a, a church that's built around believers, and if, as long as people confess Christ and don't live scandalously, you have to assume they're Christians almost. Give them the benefit of the doubt, because we can't see the heart. And especially Christians that have been Christians for a long time, we, we, we're we aware of our own problems, and uh, so sometimes they tend to be a little bit more not so fiery at times, because if we're mindful of ourselves, yeah, 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 and God's grace. But this Mike Bickle affair, uh, actually the statement that was put out, I haven't looked at it in person, I understand it's online, by the uh, the advocates for these women. There was two former, because I saw, just saw this as part of a vi uh, video. I saw the thing on the screen, but uh, apparently you can download it someplace. There were two people that were part of the leadership, formerly part of the leadership team. In other words, inside core. This is a huge church with over 2,500 employees. I think they're not paid, though. Uh, but they, so you had two former like board members and inner inner leadership team and then another pastor that had been longtime part of IHOP uh, so these are people that know in know the inside they know Mike Bickle and uh, were with him for a long time and probably know these women and 
as I was trying to inform people, I got a lot of negative feedback. A lot of the feedback came from a couple people over and over and over and over again. Obviously, I must have said something that provoked them. Good. Maybe they'll think about things. But, yeah, there's uh, serious issues. For me, the more serious issue is the charismatic, or in this case, the hyper-charismatic, or a third wave kind of stuff, which really goes back to some of the very, very early bizarre stuff that happened in the Pentecostal movement, latter rain kind of stuff. They, Even though the Assemblies of God squashed that once upon a time, it seems to have reappeared again. These things always, because they're demonic, uh, they're moved by demons. That's that's what's go, be going on behind the scene. And how do I know that? Because personal experience. And scripture. Uh, but yeah, when you, when you can see it in the scripture and you've had experience with these kind of things, yeah, yeah when... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, especially when when that uh, pastor came in to lay hands on us. And it's like, yeah, that was definitely demonic, 100%. Having had very close, before I was saved, having been uh, possessed or demonized. Pos yeah, possessed. I was like the demoniac of the, guard, uh, the gatherings. I can sympathize with that very deeply. <clears throat> And I sympathize with people that, that are in that situation because I was in that situation. You don't believe in demonic possession? It's there. It is there. Just don't go by what the movies do. Don't pay attention to that. Christ can set you free. He's the only one that can. So, first of all, what do I want to do? Okay, so people, people that are in the charismatic movement, I'll give you a, a YouTube site to take a look at. Fighting for the Faith. Chris Roseboro, my brother in Christ out there, and the edge, the, the borderlands between Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, Norwe I think it's a Norwegian. <clears throat> they used to have, actually, a Norwegian Lutheran denomination. My grand The church that I was raised in most of the time when we lived in that area uh, and the church I was baptized in and confirmed in was once upon a time uh, the Norwegian Lutheran, the Norwegian Lutheran Church, because my grandfather, well, he had to learn English, and my grandfather, mother, probably, I'm sure, she, yeah, she did speak Norwegian, <coughs> because sometimes I would ask her what my grandfather was saying, and she said um, something not good. <laughs> I, I can remember him singing some, he'd get a little tipsy at Christmas or something and start singing a Norwegian bar song. And my grandmother would scold him. None of, none of the rest of us knew what it was, but she knew what it was. But yeah, they had uh, ethnic, so like today you have ethnic uh, Hispanic churches, a lot of those, ethnic Korean churches, Chinese churches, all kinds of things in the United States. Once upon a time, we had ethnic German churches and uh, Luther, uh, Norwegian churches, both of which were typically, well, uh, the German could have been Catholic. None of the Norwegian churches were Catholic. But Germany was split between uh, Catholics and uh, Lutherans, and there were some other things they called Reformed in there. But uh, so go over to uh, if you're a charismatic or hyper charismatic or Pentecostal. This is a good website for you to go to on YouTube. He also has a website, a regular website called Fighting for the Faith, uh, Pirate Christian Radio Productions. Now, I don't want to explain what pri pirate radio is uh, because it wouldn't mean anything to most people today. But I know what pirate radio is. It's radio broadcasting from outside the national boundaries. In other words, uh, um, illegal broadcasting. And a pirate radio station is a radio station that is not oper operating within the bounds of, of national law. So they, 
they have a boat or something offshore, and they broadcast from that. And he turned it, took it into a pirate theme somehow. So he's a, but no, he's he's a good brother in Christ. Um, I don't know why he. I don't think he was originally Lutheran, but he's got a a quaint Lutheran church on the fringe lands between. <laughs> I know those areas between Minnesota and. Uh, Nor uh, Norway, <laughs> North Dakota, and he even knows what lutefisk is. So, uh, yeah, I've got actually had a, a little conversation with him. I don't know if it was where it was, maybe Twitter or something once upon a time. But yeah, he's uh, uh even though he's a Lutheran, <laughs> I would go to his church. I don't know if he let me in though. I think he would. I, I know. I, from what I know about Chris, I do not think he's Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. Uh, so, yeah, I've been in churches that uh, Lutheran churches, uh, like AALC churches, and there's some others that like that small denominations that aren't sectarian, aren't as sectarian as Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. That I wouldn't. I don't know if I could actually join them because they were require you to usually accept things that I don't really accept. But uh, as long as you want a biblical Christian, you know, it's, <laughs> that should be good enough. Christ in the scriptures, what else do we need for fellowship? Well, all we need, really need is Christ. Tradition gets in the way, you know, that's that's where the problem comes in. But yeah, if, if you're in the charismatic movement, uh, if, if you, uh, he does get a little bit Especially his his cover pages for his videos, but he uh, he handles the Bible excellently. If if just watch him to see how he handles Scripture, reading it carefully in context, 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 context. But uh, his his uh, flashy things in the front are a little bit. But yeah, I don't know how he does it. It would drive me nuts. I think he's on Facebook, too, I see. And six more links, it says. So, yeah, go check out Fighting for the Faith and just search for your favorite super prophet. He's probably done videos on them. Exposing their errors. Comparing what they say to the Scripture. That's what he does. He compares what these teachers and prophets and apostles say, compares that to the Word of God. Recommend him highly. Now, what I want to talk about here is, as far as uh, IHOP, let's take a look at the sample here. They have a 24-7 prayer thing. Uh, this is reminiscent of some of the things that developed and have been resurrected or reincarnated uh, recently that were uh, some of the mythologized heroes of early Pentecostalism. It's, it's like the United States. We have civil religion in the United States. We have a religion that worships certain individuals like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson. And we're taught from our earliest days in public school to pledge allegiance to the flag and to worship these people. Uh, yeah, that Washington was so honest, he, he confessed to cutting down a cherry tree. Big deal! Big deal! <laughs> wow, he confessed to his childish act. Um, and what, uh, he, he was a Christian because he was seen, supposedly seen praying in the snow. Big deal! Prostitutes pray every day. Most of them, they all say, yeah, I pray. I know what they pray for too. They need another customer. I'm not. I'm being serious too. I'm being very serious. That's so. I, I'm not just making this stuff up, people. I, I'm not. Yeah, you know, it can sound like it, but I've been out in the streets. I mean, I've talked to these people. I worked with homeless for years. Tried to, you know, and I thought this really is not helping. So when I talk about, you know, like homeless shelters and, and how these things are counterproductive a lot of times, like the uh, food pantries that churches have, 
for the general public. I mean, Christian Christian charity first goes to Christians, but usually Christians aren't in need, except in places like Gaza. We need to remember there's there's supposedly around seven thousand Christians. There were what seven churches or three churches there. But the Israelis have been systematically destroying those like everything else. These people that worship Israel, you dispensationalists, you need to repent of your sin, of idolizing that godless, wicked nation. Stop believing John Darby and C.I. Schofield. It is garbage. It's got just enough truth in it to sound biblical. Repent of that stuff before you end up worshiping the beast. Israel is a beast. Just look what they're doing. In your face, genocide. They don't even care. The entire world can see what they're doing. And they're doing it anyway. Even Hitler hid what he did. These people do it openly. They flaunt it, just like so much other sin today. They're publicly flaunting their wickedness. They don't care that the world hears what they say they're doing. They can see what they're doing. But that's bad. They display their sin like Sodom, Israel. And they're one of the focuses of that sin, too, by the way. Tel Aviv, vacation spot for a certain sexual preference, preferences. So this is a prayer meeting at IHOP, 24-7. Well, let's listen to it a little bit. I, I what just happened to randomly pick the, pull this up, um, and just now they just, like, changed their worship team. So I, I've pulled it back a while, like uh, maybe a couple hours, to something that was a, consistent with what I was watching originally. That's a little hot. Uh, by the way, this is unrehearsed. This is done 24 hours a day, seven days a week, under the so-called inspiration of the Spirit. And uh, so at different points, individuals will, they will go into a pattern of droning, um, repetition, and then at some point, point some person will feel moved to uh, change something or say something or prophesy something and then then it goes back into the droning repetitious droning and of course they have the guitars and which are percussion instruments here and a drum percussion instrument so you have and a keyboard in the back Whatever the people need, they have a variety of things. Also, they've got staged, stage lighting here for video. To create these, this is a very carefully prepared, an environment to induce the proper spiritual ambiance. Let both junior confess. Son of David, have mercy, Lord, even as Jesus, you went to Samaria on the way to Jerusalem, and you saw ten lepers who cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy upon us, and you healed them, Lord, not only, yeah, you cleansed them. 
mercy, Lord, even if people, our lives are protected, and even if they're delivered of sickness, but unless the deliverer from yeah, I'm going to switch it ahead a little bit here. In the judgment of God to come, we ask that they would perish. Not only Long prayer. We see you for the first time. Israel would come into her fullness. Now we have they another person praying in someplace. In all your glory. And this love, this very oh, love of Christ up here within us. At the keyboard. That you're burning within us. Every heart. Lord, each and every one would fall to their knees. Boy, long prayer. Just repeat, repeat, repeat. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. You got an audience? Okay. That's enough of that. So what's going on here? Uh, this is a combination of, well, this has much more to do with the flesh than it has to do with anything spiritual. This is much like um, pagan religion. It is much like uh, certain sects of Hinduism or Buddhism uh, where uh, and native pagan religions in the United States and Africa where you have a rhythm, repetitive rhythm, that's what drums and guitars are for, uh, and because this kind of acoustic, these are not classical guitar players here. They're rhythm. It's rhythm, chords, rhythm. And so it creates a, it shuts down your brain. The droning and rep repetitive lyrics, or whatever that you want to call these things, just a repetitive phrases is all they are, is a musical phrase, and it's repeated over and over and over and over again and interspersed with, uh, uh, what, are, what are we going to say, extemporaneous prayer, uh, and they call this uh, prayer. Okay, what does Jesus say about prayer? <laughs> this will not only condemn these people, but it will condemn all prayer meetings, in fact. So-called prayer meetings. Are they scriptural? I don't go to prayer meetings. I'll tell you why, too. The problem with prayer meetings, it's supposed to be a conversation between you and God. The last thing you want is other people listening in. Because, then, I mean, do you really want to have a private conversation with God, with everybody else listening in, too? I mean, you're going to empty, you're going to bare your heart, you're going to confess your sins, you're going to ask God to, to cleanse you and all the... You need an audience for that? You're weird. You're an exhibitionist then, you know? <laughs> That'd be like uh, a person that wants to, to make love to their wife with an audience. I mean, that's, well, there, I suppose there's people like that. But that, no. No, you're having an intimate time with God. Why do you want anybody else involved? Uh, and I have scripture for that, too. And so I do not go to prayer meetings because you get so, okay, break up into small groups and groups of prayer. Why? This whole lie that people agreeing together in prayer somehow makes it more powerful, that's nonsense. That has nothing to do with prayer. Where two or, uh, you know, where you have two or more uh, agree together, it'll be done for, that has to do with church discipline. It has nothing to do with prayer. Context is important. So let's go over to Matthew chapter 6. What does Jesus say about prayer? Uh, see, I'm, you know, Bickle and IHOP and all this kind of stuff, I'm much more concerned about the, this kind of, you know, the, the, the sexual aberrations just go with it. They go with it because of the flesh. Having, uh, you know, sexual sin in a church that is powered by flesh, and this charismatic stuff is of the flesh, it's not of the Spirit of God. 
And because it's flesh, it attracts demons, just like a dead carcass attracts flies. Happened at Azusa Street. And this proves it's of the flesh because fortune tellers and occultists and everything else began to attend there. Why? Because they could smell the smell of rotting flesh. Their demons were attracted to it. Those th things are power, if they have any reality to them all, there's demonic entities that are active in them. Some of it's just con, uh, you know, it's just con jobs. But there is demonic activity that empowers things, and demons do have knowledge that they can give to their the, the people they are powering or inhabiting. Uh, again, I saw not too long ago the woman that we were trying to work with, one of them uh, collapsed, and and all of a sudden her countenance just changed. It's like, and I realized to me this is this is not the same person, and it was speaking to me. It's like, mm, I know what this is. <clears throat> yep. Jesus Matthew 6 starting at verse 5 And when you pray you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in synagogues and the street corners that they may be seen by men Well doing it live streaming 24-7 on YouTube, why are they doing that? Do they do it to be seen by God? This is a stage. Why are they doing this? To be seen by men, as Jesus says. T standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, if you're going out there and, and you got to go out in public and pray so people can see you, this is who you, Jesus is talking to. To be seen by men, most assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Of course, this was you know, like the Pharisees, uh, and uh, they were regarded as spiritual for doing this, as more spiritual for doing this. And they wanted to be seen as being more spiritual. What's this? What's this? Why is this on YouTube? <laughs> but when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father in the secret place or secret. And the father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. In other words, Get alone by yourself. It doesn't mean going necessarily into a room. It's like I, I prefer to go out into the woods someplace uh, out in God's creation, away from man-made garbage and people. I don't want other people listening in because I'm talking to my Father. I'm talking to my Savior. And it is a personal conversation. And no, I don't hear God speak words. He doesn't have to speak words. He communicates in a much more profound way. Uh, he just enlightens us. He just gives us understanding. He doesn't need to use words. Words are very limiting. God just can communicate directly. doesn't need that. You are made one spirit with him. He can, it is a, a connection that's closer than your mind is to your body. We have made, been made one spirit with him if you're born again. He doesn't need to use words. It's not, he communes with us. It's not a communication process. It's much higher than that. At least that's my opinion. So the people that want to be sane, they've got their reward. <laughs> but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret. In secret, I know they have a secret place here in the New King James. 
and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Mm, repetitions. As the heathen do. Why do the heathen use vain re repetitions? To enter into an altered state of consciousness. Your brain shuts down. It says, what does your brain do? So an altered state of consciousness is when you're not actively thinking. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to shut the conscious mind down. They want you just to be open and not thinking. This is what happens in pagan meditation, in, in uh, transcendental meditation, in centering in the Catholic Church. All this stuff is to shut your conscious thoughts down so you're not thinking about what you're saying and your environment or anything else. Just shut down and go blank. I think what happens with repetition, with drums, rhythmic uh, uh, music, uh, vain repetition, um, saying the rosary 150 times, that's, you know, that's vain repetition too, is your brain, your brain just gets bored and just says, oh, there's nothing happening here. I might as well take a nap. And that opens you up. So you're not on guard. You're not wondering, what's going on here? What's this? Is this of God? Is No. It's See, this is thinking, trying to, to, to know whether this is of God, for example, whether this is true. That is a big, big, big no-no in the Pentecostal, charismatic, um, whatever you want to call the third wave thing. It's to shut down and just experience. It just experience it. Experience God or whatever that is that you're in the presence of. It's about experience. The Pentecostal, charismatic, hyper-charismatic, third wave, whatever you want to call it, post-charismatic, it's all about experience and power. That's it. It's not about Jesus Christ. It's not about understanding God's will. It's not about knowing God. It's about experience. You might have heard about soaking time. In other words, getting, quote, unquote, slain in the spirit, end up laying on the floor, just soaking God in. Or as Stephen Crowder said, toking the spirit. Toking the spirit. Particularly blasphemous. But yeah, th this is, has nothing to do with Christ. You know, as, as, as I've, re well, I'll tell you again because somebody may have not heard, seen the other video, uh, that uh, when I was going to a missionary institute down in Mission, Texas, that was to learn Spanish, uh, they were charismatics, and they invited a speaker in from a large uh, area charismatic church, quite large, like 1,000 members. And he had gone to, uh, I don't know if it was Brownsville or... Now, back then, it was probably one of these other Toronto Blessing or something like that, uh, and had received the Spirit there. See, these these current kind of revival things, charismatic, you can go there and receive an impartation of the Spirit of that revival and then take that imparted Spirit back to communicate that Spirit to your home church. So it's like getting an infection and taking it back. And that's what it is. It's a spiritual infection because it's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't need to be imparted and carried someplace else, does he? Of course, doctrine, sound biblical doctrine, is unknown among charismatics because they're not interested in it. They want to experience something that they call God. It's experience, and they want power. They want the power to get God to do what they want. But it's mostly about experience, some state. And an altered state of consciousness allows you to experience things that aren't real or experience spiritual things that aren't of God. Because entering a, an on a, a altered state of consciousness, like whether it's through uh, repetitive prayer, uh, chanting, uh, drumming, all these things, or the quick and easiest way is to use drugs, but the most dangerous way, you will open yourselves up to a spiritual word, world and you can be imparted a spirit. 
especially if you invite one in. You just don't know who you're inviting in because Satan's a liar. They'll come as, I'm the Holy Spirit. Yeah, really. But at that, at that uh, missionary institute, the preacher had come in, and he was, uh, gave a sermon, and then he was going to—the uh, the important time was, we're going to have some time, and I'm going to impart the Spirit to you if you want this Spirit. So almost all the class went forward, and I didn't. I sat in the back. And watch this thing, and I was while I was doing it, I was thinking, I was being open-minded, I was foolishly, and I was, I was still in the charismatic area back then, uh, but I was always apart from them too. I was never with the in the in group. I was like always standoffish from it. God was protecting me, I think, and. Anyway, this I was just thinking, Lord, is, is this of you, or what is going on here? And that spirit spoke to me, and he said, Stop trying to discern me and submit. And as soon as that spirit spoke, I knew it was not the Holy Spirit at all. Yeah, that was not the spirit that revealed Jesus Christ crucified for my sins to me. No way. And my response was the best one possible. I left the room rapidly. Say, I don't want anything to do with this. But the, the other, my classmates, they were up there spread out in the floor, everything else, you know, so-called slain in the spirit, soaking this thing up. And when they finally came to and came back to the classroom, I I didn't even bother to try to say what I had heard because they wouldn't receive it anyway. They were absolutely convinced they had received a gift from God. Well, the God of this age, not the God of heaven. So Jesus says, pray by yourself. And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions. In other words, don't try to enter into an altered state of consciousness as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for the many words. Yeah. How much you will pray? I'll pray and pray and pray. No. Why? Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need, that you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So it starts with what? It's a very short prayer. Thank God. He's, God doesn't need to listen to you drone on and on and on. It starts with him and his will. Our Father, hallowed, holy, revered be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means that his will is not being done on earth all the time, so we're to pray that it is done. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, once it starts with God's desires and then goes down to what we need. Give us this day our daily bread, what we need today to live. Forgive us our debts and for, as we forgive our debtors or forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation. That's the one the Pope altered. He said he didn't like that one. So Pope Francis decided, of course, he's above Jesus Christ. So he changed it to something else because he didn't believe that God could possibly lead us into temptation. Um, well, actually, God doesn't. It's a mis misunderstanding there. But deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Short prayer. Sufficient. Covers everything. You don't have to detail everything out. God knows what you need. It's like, you know, somebody says, well, I've got a friend that has this, uh, a problem. You don't need to know what the problem is. God knows what the problem is. Or don't you believe in God? Or you think God is ignorant. You need, you need to educate him. Uh, this stuff here is not prayer at all. 
Oh, I could have shown you that, couldn't I? Yeah. There we go. The stuff at IHOP, what's that have to do with prayer? How does that correspond to what Jesus said? Doesn't at all. This is man-made. This is, again, much like pagan religion. This is much like uh, uh, some of the, like, a voodoo, more like voodoo and uh, uh, some of the Hindu cults, the Hindu, uh, uh, what, what kind of, kundalini cults, where they have these strange manifestations and, and everything, too. Again, pagan religion, like Native American religion in North America, too, the, the, the drums are part of the thing. The drums and the dancing, working yourself into a altered state of consciousness seeking to be possessed by uh, spirits, power spirits, animal spirits, uh, that will be your guide and empower you in battle or whatever. That, that's pagan religion. It has nothing to do with the God Almighty, and the natives generally do know about the, the great God but they don't worship the great God. They worship local deities because those are the things they deal with in everyday life, they think. Because they don't know God. All right, so that's, that's the problem with, with uh, really the problem with the, the religion that calls itself Pentecostalism, charismatic, and uh, Wimber's third wave kind of stuff, which is what we have here at IHOP. All right, so back to the uh, the particular allegations against Bickle. I saw some comments about, well, did they do Matthew eighteen? Okay, what's Matthew 18? As far as the allegations, uh, particularly from women, uh, that they were sexually abused in some way, apparently some of them in ways that violate the marriage covenant, in other words, adultery. That's, that's a sin that violates, if you have a sin that violates the marriage co uh, covenant, that is called adultery without using the word. So here, uh, but let's see, Matthew 8. So here's Matthew 18. While we're at it, he's talking about, uh, he has this, let's start a little up here just to add some other material in here because it's, there's other people out there that are being uh, deceived by Calvinism. And, uh, not all Calvinism is, is wrong. Just some of the very thing, the core that makes it Calvinism is wrong, what makes it unique. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. <clears throat> Calvinism doesn't believe that. <clears throat> Calvinism believes that you're saved or lost because of God's eternal decree of all things. All things. Absolutely everything. Every sin, every wickedness, God decreed it because God wants it to happen. And it must happen because God decreed it. Which is logically inconsistent, of course, because if that's true, then how can God judge the world? On what basis? Because everything is his will. The rapist does the will of God just as certainly as the saint does in Calvinism. Calvinists generally don't understand that, but it's right there in their confessions that God decreed all things. And they mean all things. Now, if you said he framed all things, he created the framework in which all things exist and interact. But when you say everything that happens is his will, well, that's when Calvinism gets incredibly ugly. And once I understood that, bye-bye, John Calvin. Uh, it didn't come from him. It goes back to Aristotle, and through Aristotle, it goes to Augustine and others. But yeah, this was, Martin Luther was just as firmly predestinarian as Calvin, if not more so. 
But uh, Lutheranism rapidly moved away from it. Melanchthon, uh, Luther's uh, successor, uh, did not hold to that. Not really. So uh, some people were saying, uh, questioning on the Internet, was uh, Matthew 18 properly followed? The Jesus gives a procedure down here in Matthew 18, starting at uh, verse 15. So verse 14, though, this is what I was talking about with Calvinism. Even so, it is not the will of your Father uh, who is in heaven that even one of these little ones should perish. So it's not God's will that that God wants. God says he does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance, all to come to, to eternal life, all to come to salvation, all to come to, 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 uh, to, to, to the knowledge of him. That means that now Calvinism do not, denies that. They'll say, well, he wants all sorts of people to come. That's not true. That's not what the Greek says. It says all, and it means all. There's a, it's a very specific form that means all, all-inclusive. And it's exactly what Jesus says here. It's not Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, verse 15, this is 1815 is what they were talking about. Do, did these accusers follow this? Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. In other, this is like something your brother doesn't seem to understand. But if he will not hear, take with you one or, uh, one or more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even, uh, to even hear the church, let him be to, uh, to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Okay, so people were questioning, was this done? It's not relevant to the situation. Not relevant. It's misapplication of that. So here's the the actual application of here's in Timothy. The proper look here uh, appears as in Timothy chapter 5, uh, starting at 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear. Okay, so and it, to, to take to to uh, says I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Why? What's he supposed to be doing? See, people that don't consider the context and, and who it's written to and everything else will fail to understand the scripture properly. This is the Apostle Paul writing to his protege, his assistant, uh, the one who was he was uh, that will be, in a sense, taking his place with Paul's death, soon death, Timothy. And Timothy, uh, Paul had Paul with often with Timothy together had established a lot of churches, and in the uh, um, in his letters here he tells Timothy to go to these churches and appoint elders, bishops, or same thing, or deacons, uh, bishop overseer, and, uh, the word bishop there is actually overseer, and uh, it's the same as elder. It's just elder would have been in a Jewish context, uh, elders in the synagogue, and uh, overseer would be more familiar to Gentiles, the concept. Same thing. Same thing. They're not different. And and deacons. Deacons are those that are in charge of making sure the, the needy inside the church are properly and equitably taken care of. And those who are worthy of receiving help. Because there's aren't there's ones that aren't worthy of receiving help. So that's where the matter of judging, that's where the matter of being equitable comes in here. So he said, do, as far as receiving an accusation against an elder, except from two or three witnesses. 
So this has nothing to do with Matthew 18. Why? Because Timothy is in a position who, he is the one who would have been appointing the elders. He's the emissary of the Apostle Paul. So he's above the elders. And the accusation has been brought to him against elders that he perhaps appointed. That's why Paul charges him before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels to observe these things without prejudice, partiality. Do nothing from partiality. So he's to judge properly in this situation. As someone who is above the situation and responsible and has the authority. See, this is not... This is, this is this kind of situation, too. So if an elder in the church has a, abused somebody sexually, the accusation would go to Timothy, not to the elder. That's stupid, especially in that kind of offense. That's not like your brother did something to you that he wasn't really aware of, perhaps, and you're supposed to bring your complaint to him and said, because usually it's a misunderstanding. Well, you said this, and I was offended. I didn't intend to offend you. You know, that that's, uh, or uh, he did something that was not quite kosher, shall we say, a transaction or whatever. And, and But it's, it's not like sexual assault. If, if he wasn't aware of that, it's like, no, this is, this is where, where the situation comes in. It's 1 Timothy 5.19. So you have to have someone uh, who is not, you don't take it to the elder, you take it to something higher. In this case, it was Timothy. So if he's out of church here and there's a problem going on and they bring an accusation to him, he's, Paul says don't receive receive a complaint against an elder based on only one thing, one person, or one, you know, so it's, if it's maybe multiple witnesses to a particular event, or you have a, a, uh, a sinful thing going on that there's been multiple victims, and they bring it. Or their husbands bring it, for example. Although a husband might just avenge himself on his own. Uh, minister discipline <laughs> with a stick. Oh, actually, in a case like that, say if uh, in, in a church like this, if the husband is higher than the congregation, really, in a situation because a marriage, if a marriage covenant's been violated, because the scripture says the husband is the head of the wife, Paul says, but the Christ is the head of the husband. It doesn't say that the elders of the church are in between. And the family is a more fundamental institution than a local congregation. So he could take it directly to the church because this was, especially in something like this, because this is a sin unto death, which I take to mean as something that would be a death penalty under the Old Covenant. Uh, violating somebody's wife is, would be a sin unto death under the law of Moses. So this, th that is a manifest evidence well, John writes that we know that no murderer, another sin unto death, has eternal life. No one that commits adultery, for example, with somebody in, in the church, they're to be cast out of the church. They're not to be restored. They're cast out. Now, this is the kind of sin that gets you cast out. You know, that's... Uh, how can a born-again Christian do that? David wasn't born again. So these people, especially when you get multiple accusations over a period of time, and they're credible, and these, these people that the, the, they were brought to were people that were elders uh, at one time, and another pastor that was associated with it, uh, but wasn't, you know, apparently wasn't, uh, he might have been, I don't know exactly what his relationship was, but uh, connected somehow with IHOP. 
And they looked at these allegations from these different women and said, "These we think these are credible. So obviously you got a system here with a, an incredibly powerful man with a very devoted following, and it's very dangerous to bring accusations. And what does, does, what does IHOP respond with is having their attorney trying to identify and contact these women. Well, if your attorney contacts somebody, what's he going to be doing? Trying to silence them, threaten them. So if you get a call, contact from an attorney of, say, a, a corporation or a ministry like this, and you have, a, you have tried to re expose something they're doing, what, what's they going to try to do? They're going to try to threaten you with uh, lawsuits, defamation of character, something like that. That's what they'll be. That's why you go to an attorney to threaten with legal action. Why else would you go to an attorney? To your attorney to mediate, to have them investigate the truth and prosecute you? I don't think so. Are we so stupid? Are we as dumb as the Israeli propagandists that indict themselves with their own propaganda? No, and then they're supposed to be rebuked openly before the whole church. So if there's, if there's two or three allegations, that is sufficient, credible allegations, for Timothy to convict them. That's enough. And he said, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear. You think they remain on as elders? No, they don't. No, they've given them, demonstrated they're, they're not capable of being elders. Elders are supposed to be above reproach. What are the odds that none of, there's like 20 women have uh, recounted incidences of various types, apparently, and eight of them involved, apparently, violating of the marriage covenant. <clears throat> so one way or the other, either his marriage covenant with his wife or their marriage covenant with their husband. So uh, the, the, the <laughs> so if say one in 10 accusations that happen in churches is false, and I'm being generous there as far as toward the uh, uh, the false side. I doubt if that many. But once in a while, you do have a disgruntled person that's maybe not entirely emotionally or mentally stable. Yeah, they, they do exist, but they're not born-again Christians. And, you know, so if you have a, a, a person that is a, a born-again Christian with a track record, and they bring an accusation, the odds are like 99% of the time it's going to be, you know, solid. If they don't have a reputation as being, you know, not solid. So really, what happens in these leadership too, if, if especially when a man creates a thing, Bickle founded IHOP, is it's his ministry. It's not, doesn't belong to the congregation. And any, any opposition to him is going to be taken personally. That's how it works. I mean, I've been around things quite a I mean, I'm 68 years old. I've seen a lot inside the church and out. And I've seen a lots of things happen. And the, my opinion is, from my experience, is if you're... Uh, especially in independent ministries and especially charismatic, but also other ones where you have a, a, a personality cult. Anytime you have a personality cult, well, the ministry founded by one guy and he's the center of it and everybody's looking to him, watch out because it's very easy for Satan to flip somebody like that, especially if they're not truly a Christian. And you don't have to truly be, be a Christian to be a Pentecostal or especially a charismatic 
or the third wave. They don't even care about that much. It's not about Jesus Christ. So the, the standard here is you take it to an authority that, that's preferably higher. And that, that's a problem with, like, Bickle. There is no one above Bickle except God. So the rest of the church should be praying, Lord, if this is true, destroy Bickle. Because he's bringing slander upon your name. And he's prophesying falsely. That's his ba major crime. He's a false prophet and a false apostle. Destroy him and rebuke him in the presence of all. Maybe I should say rebuke. Rebuke him, Lord, in the presence of all, that the rest may fear, that the rest of these crackpots may tremble. So there's another issue here that's beyond this, and it has to do with not only this kind of stuff, but it has to do with uh, there's another thing in motion because of the society in the United States and in other places, I suspect, too, but especially in the United States, uh, with the confusion of Christianity with the state. See, this goes way back to Constantine. There's a movement here in the United States growing called Christian nationalism, uh, also called theonomy, uh, reconstructionism, but the idea of creating recreating the United States as a Christian nation. Politically, well, this has been done and practiced for a long time, going, going back to Constantine. The, the marriage between the beast and the harlot is what it is. It's a harlot, it's a, the church wedding itself to the world instead of being faithful to her husband because we're talking about violations of the marriage covenant. Well, when you, when you belong to Christ, you've entered into a marriage covenant with the Lamb of God. He's the bridegroom, you're the bride. Unfaithfulness to that by wedding yourself to the world, by committing fornication with the world, is spiritual adultery. In the Old Testament, God called Israel a harlot, a prostitute, because they committed spiritual adultery with the idols of the pagans and joining themselves to the pagans. They were supposed to be joined to him. He was their husband. Were they faithful? No, they weren't. So we are instructed explicitly by the Apostle Paul about our relationship with the world, how we are supposed to conduct ourselves in this world. Are we supposed to do what Billy Graham and the neo-evangelical set is become friends with the world, uh, join with the world, try to excel in the world, so they'll look at us and say, aren't they wonderful people? I wonder what God they worship. See, it's, it's, it's again, neo-evangelicalism at its core is self-centeredness, and it's deceitful. Because why do they, what is the core motivation for a person wanting to go join the world? Because they love the world. They love the world. Why did Israel want to join itself to the pagan idols? Because it loved those idols. It didn't love God. Same thing today. Billy Graham, I suspect, this is only a suspicion, that the reason he started out in fundamentalism, but he didn't like it. Uh, he went to Bob Jones, didn't like that, went to some other, they went, went down to uh, Florida to a school down there, and they ended up going to Wheaton, uh, which is now a big Billy Graham place. But, but the idea of him, him and uh, men like uh, Okanga and others uh, at the end of World War I, or World War II, getting a little old there, World War II, didn't like fundamentalism, and fundamentalism has, had become, well, it had problems. 
it had become, it, it went off course. But what they didn't like was the separatism in fundamentalism. Because, why? Because I suspect they really loved the world. People like Graham love the world. In fact, I just saw some pictures posted by his son um, having to do with the death of uh, Billy uh, Carter's wife, or Billy, uh, Jimmy Carter's wife, uh, the other day. And it showed a picture, he posted a picture of his father, Billy Graham, with her and uh, Jimmy Carter, had his arms around them, or arms around Carter. Uh, Billy Graham liked to hang around with the presidents. He liked to hang around with famous people. Why? Why? Well, he loved the world. That explains the new evangelical movement. They didn't like the separation from the world. Why? Because they loved the world. That's why he never really preached the gospel much. It wasn't about Christ and him crucified. If you look at his crusades, look at the whole thing, it's not really about Christ and him crucified. It's about it, he's the original seeker-sensitive guy, inviting people to the church for other reasons. He would bring up entertainers and sports stars and other people who had claimed to be Christians. In order to prove you could be worldly and successful in the world and yet be a Christian. In spite of that. So what does the Scripture say about our relationship with this world? Paul gives us explicit instructions. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 14. And this has to do today with this movement to, to wed the church to the state again. We had a thousand, over a thousand years of that. What did it result in? Thousands, perhaps millions of martyred Christians. State Christianity is never real Christianity. It can't be. Real Christianity is supernatural in its relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot get that through the state, and the state always uses religion for its own ends. The state is ordained for the world by God. It is not ordained for the church. He is our government. And to try to join the, in, the, or the thing that God has ordained for the sinners to what is ordained for the saints creates Babylon the Great, the harlot, with her cup filled with the blood of the martyrs and the saints. Those who, the, the Babylon the Great always seeks to kill those who are truly Christian, because she can't maintain the illusion that she's the bride of Christ in the presence of the real bride of Christ. A harlot never looks like a virtuous woman. They have a different countenance. They, they look different. They are different. They don't have this the same glow, shall we say. They don't. They look hard and dried out. Because they are. They're human beings, but their 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 soul is darkened by all the abuse they've done to it. They're not Christians. <laughs> you know, I have, this, there'll probably be a movement out there, you know, because you've got all these people that, that live wicked, sinful lifestyles, wicked according to the world, Word of God, but yet, yet they want to call themselves Christians. I'm sorry, you can't do that. You have to choose. No one that practices those things has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. You have, to, you have to be saved out of that lifestyle. 
whether it's prostitution or other things, including being a money lover, just as bad, just as much idolatry. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be bound together, for, verse 14. Do not be bound together, excuse me, wrong button. Do not be bound together with un well, maybe not. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together, fastened together. This is a reference to a commandment in the law of Moses that you are not to yoke an ass with a oxen, a donkey with an oxen. Why? They're not balanced. They don't pull together. They won't work yoked together with a yoke for pulling a wooden beam that connects animals together. So you have a yoke of horses, two horses, for example, or a yoke of oxen, two oxen, and they've got a wooden beam across their shoulders or a harness, padded harness, so they pull together. A donkey and an oxen can't pull together. They're not compatible. They're unbalanced. You'll end up going in circles. Because that's what it means, bound. So you're not to be bound uh, in a, a binding relationship. Fastened together, harnessed together with unbelievers. What is this talking about government? What business has a Christian becoming part of the Congress? You're, you're, you're bound by oath together with unbelievers or part of the Masons or part of all kinds of things or marrying an unbeliever. You're being bound together with the world. You cannot do that. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? You silly Christians running for Congress. Why do you want to be in partners with the lawlessness there? I don't care if it's Democrats or Republicans. They're lawless. People that aren't saved are lawless. People that aren't born again are lawless, whether they call themselves Christians. You can be the head of a ministry and be utterly lawless because you, you, you don't submit, subject yourself to Christ and his word. People like Mike Bickle. You can just look up his videos, see what he— He prophesies falsely. He says, thus saith the Lord, it's not God speaking. Because the words aren't in the scriptures. The message is not in the scriptures. You know, I can say, thus saith the Lord, unless you believe in Christ, you shall die in your sins. I'm speaking forth what God has said. But if I speak out of myself, out of my own words, not in accordance with the words of God's word, then I'm prophesying falsely. If I'm saying God has said what God has not said, that is false prophecy. You're a false prophet. You're speaking falsely in the name of God, the name of Christ. So what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial, a demon? Or what, what has a, be, a believer in common with an unbeliever? What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? You have nothing in common. The United States is not your nation. The body of Christ is your nation. The kingdom of God is your nation. Christ is your identity, not America. You've been deceived, and the world has worked to deceive you from your youngest days. Remember saying the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, first thing in school. Pledging allegiance to something other than Jesus Christ. All I can say is never again, 
Never again shall I ever do that. By the, by the grace of God, never again. No, Christ alone is my loyalty. I have no loyalty to the United States. I have no loyalty to a denomination. He didn't create those things. And to a man that calls himself a preacher, as long as he speaks the words of Christ faithfully, then he's my, he's my brother. And as long as he has something to say that's worth listening to, I'll listen to him. Sorry, my screen's not wide enough. <sighs> Otherwise, what do I have in common with this world? Nothing. What do I have in common with an unbeliever? Christian nationalism welds together what cannot be welded together. They're not compatible. You can't weld steel to aluminum. Can't fusion weld it. It doesn't work. You have to have some really weird exotic process for that. It doesn't work. They do not bind together. They do not fuse together. They're incompatible. They're like oil and water. They do not mix without an additive, to, to an emulsion agent to make it mix. There's it By their very nature, they don't mix. The same is true with true believers those who are born again, and the world. So if people mix with the world and are happy in the world, they are of the world. You have no business in Washington. God has not appointed us to govern this world in this time. That's only after he returns. And if people are telling you something else, they're not speaking for God. These Christian nationalists are disregarding the explicit teaching of the Apostle Paul. And you can find this other places in the Scripture. But here he's being very emphatic. But what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The United States is an idol. Nationalism is an idolatry. Patriotism is idolatry. Uh, Washington's an idol. Lincoln's an idol. Jefferson's an idol. The Constitution's an idol. Whatever you serve and adore is your idol. Lincoln was an idolater, and he's an idol. Many people worship Lincoln. They, they look to Lincoln more than they look to Christ. You were taught to do that. You were taught in public schools especially, but in many Christian schools too, to be an idolater. What does Paul say? What agreement has the temple of God? Who? What is the temple of God? All you people that are looking for Israel to rebuild an abomination on Mount Zion. What is the temple of God? For we are the temple of God, the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, seeing how all these things are true, therefore, come out of their midst and be separate says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. As usual, they put a break here where it does not belong. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. But I can't stop there. I just noticed. I cannot stop there. Especially talking about Mike Bickle and others like him. Many others that make merchandise out of the saints. Make room for us in, our, in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Paul often was accused, and he was, had people in Corinth that were saying, now who is this guy, Paul? And he had to assert his apostleship, his authority, which he didn't want to do. But he points out here that they have wronged no one. They have abused no one. They've took advantage of no one. That is not true of many, many, many people who call themselves pastors and nowadays are, are daring to call themselves prophets and apostles. They are not prophets, and they are not apostles of the living God. They are prophets and apostles of the adversary of God, the God of this age. I hope I've made myself clear. Clearer than... John MacArthur, who I do not recommend because he is not faultless. Look to Christ. Look to the Scriptures. Follow Christ. That's what you're supposed to be doing, following Christ. But we cannot wed ourselves to this world. We cannot be unequally yoked with this world, bound together with them. It does not work. And God says we want to Let's see, where was that? If we want to truly be his temple, if we want him to truly dwell in us and walk in us and be our God and us be God's people, then we are to do what? Come out from them and be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. And God says, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Which do you desire that or well, more, that or the world? Those that desire the world, let them deny Christ. Let them renounce their faith because it's false and go join the world openly. We need a good, holy apostasy. Let all the unholy unbelievers depart from the church of Christ, depart from his house, because they are unclean. They are not cleansed by the blood of Christ, because they do not belong to Christ. Let them simply confess what they truly are, prophets and apostles of Baal, or Lucifer, or whatever. Join one of those denominations, because they do exist. But don't call yourself a Christian. Don't say you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Although that is consistent with you being a deceiver. And for all of you who have been deceived by these false prophets, open your Bible and begin to read the truth. Is the New Testament all about signs and wonders? Is it all about experiencing God? Or is it all about Jesus Christ and God's salvation through faith in Christ? 
it all about Christ and Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead? Or do you think the New Testament's all about you? One way is the narrow way that leads to life, and the other way is a broad way that leads to destruction. Choose today whom you shall serve.